Shortly after 9 p.m. on the night of Thursday, April 2nd, 41-year-old Larry Marley was shot dead by a loyalist murder squad as he answered the door of his North Belfast home. When the assassin struck, Larry Marley was alone in the house with his wife Kate and the youngest of their six children, Satanta, who was just two weeks old. As well as being a devoted husband and father, Larry was also a volunteer in the Irish Republican Army. He had been active from the beginning of the struggle and was a well-known, almost legendary figure in the close-knit Ardoin community where he lived. He and Kate were married for 21 years. Larry was first imprisoned in 1972 in the cages of Longkesh. By then, the couple had had three young children. Lawrence Jr., now aged 19, Emmanuel 16, and Joseph 15. In March 1975, Larry Marley was one of 10 Republicans who escaped from Nuri Courthouse. They were appearing on charges connected with an earlier escape attempt. On the run, he resumed active service, but was recaptured in Belfast in 1977. He was charged with possession of weapons and sentenced to another 10 years in jail. Shortly afterwards, Kate gave birth to twins Sean and Seamus, now aged 13. Larry Marley was released in November 1985. At the time, the family was interviewed for a Scandinavian TV network. When he gets out, uh, what it, will that be like? Great. <laughs> Great. Um, well, we can't wait to get out now. I mean, it'll be 13 years then, when he, just when he's getting out. So, we're hoping now, when he gets out, well, they'll probably try and get a job and the kids say, can't wait to take it because they're all big, right? You know, and they have to, he wants to spend more time with them. Like, he's made all plans, like what we're going to do. If you've been 13 years in prison, how do you feel today? Today? I feel very sad at leaving most of the mates behind. Uh, because I know now that the sort of policies that's been implemented within the jail, it's going to be an attempt to break down the prisoners. That's basically how I feel. Well, seeing your family again, seeing your sons in being free. Well, but you're saying being free, but I'm not free. Because it's like the British Army goes into your land. It sacks off a part of it, then they put you in prison. Then the leg of the day, they release you. Like, how are you going to feel? Like, you're not going to be happy. Most of my kids now have grew up. Uh, I wasn't here while they were growing up. It was, I was being put through the conveyor belts of the system now. What about your life in prison? Uh, you were on the blanket. Could yeah. you describe that? Well, basically what it was, was I was up in the cages, a uh, special cat prison. That's what they call the ones who they were sort of recognizing as political prisoners. I tried to escape numerous occasions. In fact, I did escape as well for a year. But when I was recaptured again, I tried again. Uh, what happened after that was, while I was at large, I carried on my role as I seen it. I was charged again with other acts, and I got another 14 years for it. So I was sent down to the hits blanks, so I wouldn't refuse to wear the prison clothes. I was down in the hits blanks for four years and three months on the protest. I watched most of the hunger strikers. I knew nearly of them all. I watched some of them in the wings before they went up to the hospital for three weeks, getting abuse from the screws. There's one of them, Lonnie McKeown, was pushed about by the leg of screws. I know most of them fairly well. So I have seen at first hand just what it's like being in there and all. And I don't know if the media puts it across even 
tell the like of other countries, just what did take place, no? The beatings were regular. You were sitting in the cell, you had a towel around you. Sometimes, other times, you had the blanket around you. You didn't wash, you didn't slap out, you were forced to put your excreta on the walls. Whenever you poured the urine out the door, you used to come up with squeezies, sort of mop thing, push it back into the cell. How, how did you manage to endure this, I mean, such a long time? But you see, people talk about endurance. What I believe is the endurance is being done by the families. Okay, I'm committed to what I believe in. But on top of that there, I have also the expect from my wife and from my sons that they also feel the same commitment as myself. And uh, I don't think that anybody in there thinks of him, the person. I don't think there is any egos. I think the egos over the years have been beat right down. Uh, you feel, all the feelings go to the leg of the families because they're the ones who are enduring the hardships. Uh, you look about you, you see, not just my own family, just look about these streets here. You see the people unemployed, there is no future at all. You have an occupational, an occupational force in the country. Now, their sole role, they try and portray themselves as peacekeeping. It's nothing like that at all. How, how do you see the future for your sons? For my sons, I see a good future for my sons because I believe that there is an awareness creeping amongst the Irish people. I'm talking about Protestant also. That they have to build a better future for the like of their, their children and stuff. Now, under the sort of system as it is now, uh, I don't think anybody sees a future because it's not a current system. You just even have to look the National Health Service. You look at all the cuts that are happening now. It's all geared so as to put the money back to the few. And if the Irish people care about themselves and about the old woman who's up the street in the winter down in hypothermia, then there has to be an awareness that we all must work, work together to move forward to better everybody in Ireland. But that door can never be done until the Brits are pulled out of Ireland. Still convinced that there could be no peace for his children or for Ireland so long as British occupation forces remained on Irish soil, Larry again resumed active service. He did not live to see his sixth child christened. Because of the British occupation, Larry had been able to spend only two short years out of the previous 15 with his family. On the night of Sunday, April 5th, volunteers of the Belfast Brigade Oakley Naharan saluted their fallen comrade and made it clear that they had paid their tribute to their volunteer. Nevertheless, British Crown forces were deployed in massive strength. For three days, horrified TV viewers round the world saw heavily armed RUC men clad in full riot gear battening unarmed mourners. The ghoulish events in Ardoin were by no means the first attacks by British forces on an Irish Republican funeral. Up until 1983, though, Republican funerals had largely gone unmolested and as this photograph of the funeral of IRA volunteer Charlie Hughes shows, British soldiers actually paid the tribute of saluting the remains. For more than a decade, by unspoken agreement, the IRA and on the whole, the British, observed the right of the bereaved, even in war, to bury their dead with dignity. As late as December 6th, 1983, at the funeral of Tyrone volunteers Colin McGurr and Brian Campbell, the RUC and British Army stayed off the streets. Ten masked and uniformed IRA volunteers escorted Colin McGurr's coffin through the small town of Coal Island, passing only yards away from the town's RUC barracks. As the procession passed the police station, 
there was little sign of the security forces, and the town came to a standstill as 10 masked IRA men escorted the coffin through the streets. Only two days after the funeral of McGurr and Campbell, the RUC tried out a new policy. Their target was the funeral in the tiny North Belfast nationalist ghetto of Bournemouth of INLA volunteer Joseph Craven, which they anticipated would be fairly small. The Crown forces staged a show of strength, and a senior RUC officer snatched Craven's belt and gloves from his coffin. Between then and the funeral of Larry Marley, the RUC and British Army escalated their attacks. They violently disrupted or harassed more than 25 funerals. They staged massive shows of military might and firepower. Their aim simply was to terrorise the nationalist people off their own streets. It was the same aim that lay behind the infamous attack by Crown forces on civil rights marchers in Derry on Bloody Sunday 1972 and on the 1984 internment commemoration in which Belfast man John Downs was killed. The funeral of young Derry volunteer Kieran Fleming two days before Christmas 1984 was the scene of the most gratuitously violent RUC attack so far on a Republican funeral. The RUC had come dressed for confrontation in full riot gear. After children threw a few stones, the RUC fired at least four plastic bullets into the mourners. Two people were seriously injured, one of them a radio journalist. As a pretext for such brutal attacks, sometimes the RUC demanded the removal of barrier gloves. Sometimes they insisted on removing the tricolour. But the funeral of Charles Breslin did not turn up as scheduled. It was halted shortly after leaving his family's home at Innisfree Gardens because police objected to the coffin bearing a tricolour and paramilitary beret and gloves. But they also attacked private funerals, such as that of volunteer Jim McKernan in Belfast or Mary McGlinchey in Bellahi County Derry, where no flag was on display. On the same day as volunteer McKernan's funeral, the RUC looked on at a distance as John Bingham, the Belfast military commander of the Loyalist UVF, was given a military-style funeral. Bingham had been executed by the IRA who had identified him as the leader of a sectarian murder squad which had killed at least five Belfast Catholics. The following month, the RUC targeted the funeral of a 61-year-old Republican veteran, James Spotter Murphy. The RUC violated the funerals of Republicans, even when they knew there would be no formal IRA presence, and even, as at the funeral of Larry Marley, when the IRA had already paid its final tribute. Larry Marley's family decided that he would be laid to rest on Monday, April 6, respecting his wish that he be buried in a manner befitting a Republican soldier. By early morning, it was clear that the RUC intended to stamp its authority on the funeral. They saturated the entire neighbourhood. Heavily armed RUC men in full riot gear surrounded the house. The very narrow path was flanked on both sides by RUC men, and it was impossible for one person to walk down, never mind uh, a coffin being carried down. Because of the RUC's aggression, Kate Marley and her sons decided that the coffin should be taken back inside the house. We are calling off the funeral today because of the refusal of the RUC 
the Alleros 20 feet space on either side of the cortege. We are asking mourners to reconvene tomorrow at the same time. We are also appealing to Cardinal O'P to intervene and allow my father to be buried in peace and with dignity. In support of the Marley family, that night at least 3,000 people attended a protest march up the Falls Road. On Tuesday morning, April 7th, nationalists from all over Belfast and the six counties rallied to support the Marley family. Hopes were high among the people that the procession would move off peacefully. Two clergymen, Father Jerry Reynolds of Clonard Monastery and a Methodist minister, had made it clear to the RUC that the family simply intended to drape the coffin with a tricolour. But again, the RUC forced confrontation. The House of Police presence, the IUC presence was double what it was yesterday and it was just impossible to move. Once we had reached the steps, it started to close in and this uh, provoked the people. We have decided to call the funeral off today because of the disturbance this morning and because the IUC are still present and tomorrow morning we will attempt to bury my father. Urgent attempts were again made to contact Bishop Daly but they were unsuccessful. I strongly object to the RUC presence. There have been many Republican funerals throughout the past 15 years. There has been trouble at none of them whatsoever. The trouble has only began because of the new policy of the RUC in attempting to prevent these funerals. They have created this problem, not us. But you feel it could get ahead if the RUC agreed to, to step back rather than to If the RUC were prepared to be sensible and to withdraw from the immediate vicinity of the cortege and allow mourners their right to be associated with the funeral, then th certainly the funeral could take place in peace and with dignity and without trouble. That night, several thousand people assembled at the Republican Memorial in Ardoin for a protest rally, where Belfast priest Des Wilson castigated the RUC for dishonouring our fellow citizens. I would be ashamed, ashamed to my life as I thought that the church, of which Larry was a fellow member with myself, did not rise up in anger against what has happened. I have been in Belfast from early yesterday morning, and I have been very, very proud of the Marley family, and of Kate Marley in particular, her strength has been absolutely unbelievable. And the, the, the mural on this wall states that it's those, it's not those who will inflict the most, but those who will suffer the most, who will be victorious in the end. Well, Kate Marley has suffered this last couple of days, and Kate Marley, at the end of this funeral, will be victorious because the RUC will not have their way. She has seen to that. And we, the Republican people of Belfast, Derry, and the rest of the people who will come to, to Belfast tomorrow from around the six counties, will see that the RUC will have no victory.
Shortly before 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the family of IRA volunteer Larry Marley carried his tricolour draped coffin from their home, where he had lain for the past six days. By now, a wide spectrum of opinion was outraged at the RUC's callous thuggery. Nationalists turned up in even greater numbers than before, unintimidated and determined to bury the IRA volunteer with honour and dignity. In the 45 minutes that it took the funeral procession to walk the half mile to Holy Cross Chapel, several RUC attempts to hem in the cortege were frustrated by resolute mourners. After the Mass, the procession paused for a few moments outside the house where Larry Marley had lived and died. Then it moved off towards the Bone and New Lodge areas. Do you not accept the criticism that perhaps there has been uh, a very heavy-handed uh, attitude by the police to this funeral? Is, is there not a tradition, even in a war situation, that you do not actually interfere with the burial of the dead? You, you know the problems that the RUC face in these very difficult matters. You know perfectly well where the solution lies. That if we could have responsible uh, behavior at, uh, in matters of this kind, then these problems would not arise in this way. Hundreds of mourners from the New Lodge, Newington and other areas lined the route waiting for the funeral to pass. At Diva Street, at the start of the Falls Road, almost 2,000 people waited patiently for several hours.
Crown Force presence was massive, but it was clear that they had failed to intimidate the Marley family, and they had failed to intimidate the nationalist people. The British press acknowledged it was the biggest display of Republican support since the 1981 hunger strike. The London Guardian reported that even patients at the Royal Victoria Hospital came out onto the streets in their dressing gowns and slippers to give support. Seven hours after the funeral had started, the coffin of IRA volunteer Larry Marley was finally laid to rest. Well, I can't thank my Larry because I can't believe. Larry would have done that. Larry would have felt the same way to me, although he's not, he's not here. But to me, Larry, uh, what would you say? Larry would have kept, would have kept on. 
Four weeks after this funeral, IRA volunteer Finbar McKenna was killed in an attack on a Belfast RUC barracks. Despite prior assurances from the RUC to the family that there would be no interference with Finbar's funeral, in scenes reminiscent of South Africa, steel-helmeted RUC men battened and kicked peaceful mourners, and after minor stone throwing, fired at least five plastic bullets at head height into the crowd. At least 19 men and women received hospital treatment. establishment politicians and church leaders could no longer ignore the anger of nationalists in the six counties and belatedly outvied with each other in denouncing the authorities. Their real concern was that the uncontrolled sectarianism of the RUC was exposing the fraudulent claims being made under the Hillsborough Treaty, claims that the RUC was now reformed, non-sectarian and acceptable to nationalists. Events show the exact opposite. The RUC, clearly on political instruction, soon announced that they would review their policy on funerals. In newspaper advertisements, RUC chief John Herman undertook that in future, Crown forces would not physically intrude or impose themselves on future burials. May 1987 also saw the funerals of eight IRA volunteers tragically mown down at Loch Gall by undercover British soldiers. Against a background of international media coverage, the RUC pulled back from confrontation and for the first time in three and a half years of bloody attacks on Republican funerals, relatives were able to bury their dead in peace and with dignity and IRA comrades to pay their last farewell. This respite was undoubtedly won by the steadfastness of many relatives, particularly the stand taken by Kate Marley and her children.
However, within a few months, the sectarian RUC were as uncontrolled as ever when they brutally attacked the funerals in Derry of IRA volunteers Eddie McSheffrey and Paddy Deary. These scenes of state repression indicated that the RUC were under virtually no political control. But well they showed too that the RUC's earlier promises to leave funerals alone were just a public relations exercise. Only time will tell. Republican mourners have proved that they will not be battered into the ground. From experience, they know that they can win not just the struggle to bury their dead in peace, but the much larger struggle to force a British withdrawal. And after so many sacrifices and so many heartbroken...